thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting this episode. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash religionforbreakfast to check out their course, Lost Christianities, taught by the leading scholar of Christianity, Dr. Bart Ehrman. This is the Jesus Fish. During the 1970s and 80s, it exploded in popularity as a Christian emblem on car bumpers, t-shirts, necklaces, and tattoos. But the fish symbol is not modern. In fact, it's one of the earliest ancient Christian symbols, stretching back to the first few centuries of Christianity's history. But why a fish? What does a fish have to do with Christianity? Well, in recent years, Christians have popularized a legendary origin story about this symbol. A legend, as we'll see later, that is almost certainly fabricated. But the legend goes that the fish symbol functioned kind of like a secret handshake. During times of Roman persecution, it wasn't safe to out yourself as a Christian. So, if you met someone and wanted to confirm that they were a safe ally, one Christian would draw half the fish in the sand, which would appear to be a simple, unassuming arc to most Romans. But if you're a Christian, you would know to complete it with another arc, forming a simple image of a fish. Other versions of this legend are less elaborate, but still argue that the fish was basically a secret code, identifying someone as a Christian. This story is not rooted in actual ancient evidence. My hunch is that it's a modern invention. The earliest reference I found thus far dates to the 1830s. However, we do have a ton of ancient archeological and textual evidence demonstrating that Christians did use the fish as a symbol for Jesus Christ as early as the second century CE. Now, whether or not it arose in response to persecution is completely speculative, but let's get into the evidence. First of all, what does it mean? Well, it derives from an acrostic embedded in the Greek word for fish, ichthus. The first letter, iota, stands for Jesus, Jesus. The second letter, chi, stands for Christos, Christ. Theta stands for theu, which is the possessive form for the word God. Upsilon stands for huios, son, and sigma for the word soter, savior. Taken together, this phrase translates to Jesus Christ, son of God, savior. This acrostic appears in both archaeological and textual evidence starting in the 2nd century CE. The most dramatic example is this archaeological object, a bilingual funerary epitaph for a woman named Lysinia Amias, which dates to around the year 200. As you can see right here in the middle, the inscription prominently displays two fish, a ship anchor, and the Greek words ichthus zonton, the fish of the living. Some scholars view this as one of the earliest examples of Christian art. If so, it's interesting that it mixes Roman religion with Christianity. Look here. DM stands for the Latin phrase dis manibus, which refers to a Roman conception of the afterlife. So, if we take this to be a Christian inscription, the Roman family who set it up presumably was comfortable mixing terminology from both Roman polytheism and Christianity. Other scholars are not so sure about this object, though. There's evidence that the stone had been erased, and that someone added the Greek words at a later date to an already existing Latin epitaph, giving the inscription a more Christian-sounding flavor. This would explain the appearance of two different languages on the object. But if this Greek section is indeed part of the original epitaph, it isn't particularly unusual for its time because ichthus graffiti has been discovered in the Roman catacombs. Here's an example of graffiti scratched on the wall of the catacomb of San Sebastiano that probably dates to the second century. Other fish paintings and graffiti dating to around the same time period also appear in the Roman catacombs. One more example before we move on to the textual evidence is this object yet another funeral epitaph, but this one for a guy named Abercius. It doesn't explicitly say that Abercius was a Christian, but his epitaph sounds pretty Christian-y. The man calls himself a disciple of a pure shepherd, and that faith furnished everywhere as nourishment a fish from a water spring, which him and his friends would eat with wine and bread. Disciple of a pure shepherd, being nourished by a fish along with bread and wine, 
Well, this certainly sounds like a reference to Jesus and the ritual of the Eucharist. And this inscription is dated somewhere between 192 and 212 CE, which might make it the earliest datable reference to the Jesus fish. So we have some archaeological evidence that suggests the fish, and specifically the ichthus acrostic, was already a Christian symbol at the turn of the 3rd century. But it's also mentioned in early Christian texts. One of the earliest definite references comes from the Christian apologist Tertullian, writing in the late 2nd or early 3rd century. Basically the same time periods of the epitaphs we mentioned earlier. In an essay on baptism, Tertullian declares, But we, little fish, according to our fish, Jesus Christ, are born in the water. Tertullian is referencing the famous Christian ritual of baptism, calling Christians little fish that are reborn in baptismal waters. But what's interesting about this passage is that Tertullian generally writes in Latin, but he suddenly inserts the Greek word ichthus when he calls Jesus a fish. Why else would he shift to the Greek unless he already knew about the acronym and assumed that his audience would as well? Okay, so that was a quick summary of the earliest evidence of the Jesus fish. Graffiti from the catacombs, a few public funeral epitaphs, and passing references in some early Christian texts. Now that we've established a baseline of the evidence we're dealing with, let's turn to the question whether or not the image of a fish or the ichthus acronym functions specifically as secret codes during times of persecution. Early in the 20th century, the historian Robert Moet argued that Christians in Alexandria developed this as a cipher during the alleged persecutions under Emperor Domitian. Domitian minted a bunch of coins in Alexandria, stamped with the title, Son of God. Moet argued that Christians invented the ichthus acrostic specifically as an imitation or parody of this imperial title. However, his argument is very speculative. But it's not necessarily unreasonable to think that the ichthus acronym meant to be secretive. If the ichthus inscription on the Licinia Amias epitaph is original, it seems to be purposely cryptic purposely not mentioning Jesus Christ. Same with the Abercius inscription. The inscription seems to talk a lot about Christian themes without referencing Christianity directly. So we can speculate they were purposely avoiding outing themselves as Christians. We also have discovered a few examples of Christian inscriptions that apparently use the eight-spoked wheel as a cryptogram of the word ichthus. See, for example, this graffiti from Ephesus that has ichthus next to an eight-spoke wheel. If you write the Greek letters on top of each other, using the crescent moon-shaped sigma, you get an eight-spoked wheel. Writing monograms as graffiti was a widespread practice in the Greco-Roman world. For example, sports factions would tag buildings with their gang names in the form of monograms, like this example from Aphrodisius in Asia Minor. So, secrecy may have been a motivating factor in developing this acronym. But there are a few problems with this interpretation. First of all, and this is a pretty big first of all, none of our early Christian texts link the Jesus fish with persecution. The persecution theory is some sort of argument from silence, inferring that it must have been a secret code, even though this idea is completely absent from the historical record. Here are the 23 most relevant early Christian texts that reference the Jesus fish, compiled in roughly chronological order by the scholar of Christian origins, Thomas Rosimus. And these writers simply do not link the fish or the ichthus acronym to Christian persecution. Instead, they link it symbolically to rituals like baptism, as Tertullian does in his essay. Others link Jesus and the fish to the Eucharist, and others invent whole new connections, like St. Augustine, who really stretches the analogy when he writes that Jesus is a fish because Jesus was able to live without sin in the depths of the waters of mortality. So he's basically just being poetic. These writers also constantly reference a bunch of different fish-related stories from Jewish and Christian scriptures. For example, a fish is a central character in the Book of Tobit, which was part of the Septuagint. In this story, the archangel Raphael instructs a guy named Tobit to cut out the gallbladder, heart, and liver of a fish that tried to bite his foot off, enabling him to create a magical substance to drive a demon away. At least one early Christian writer specifically links the fish in the Book of Tobit to Jesus and the ichthus acrostic. 
The Gospels are also full of fish imagery that explains the connection between Jesus and fish. Jesus' early crew of disciples were all fishermen, and they spend their time floating around on the Sea of Galilee on a fishing boat, with Jesus miraculously facilitating huge catches of fish. With all of this fish-filled source material, it really didn't take a ton of imagination for early Christians to associate Jesus with fish in later centuries. The persecution theory also doesn't really square with what we know about early Christian persecutions. There seems to have been empire-wide persecutions under Emperor Decius in 250, and especially under Diocletian 50 years later in the early 300s. But the persecution of Christians in the earlier centuries, when the Jesus fish was first being developed, appears to have been small-scale, local, and sporadic. Although that historian Robert Moat tries to pin the origins of the fish symbol on alleged persecutions under Emperor Domitian, there is no good evidence that these persecutions even occurred. The best evidence we have for how Roman government officials treated Christians in the early centuries comes from a letter between a Roman governor named Pliny to the Emperor Trajan, dated to about 112 CE. Pliny is downright confused about how to deal with Christians in court, and he asks Trajan for advice. Trajan writes back, saying the Christians are not to be hunted out. Sure, if they're caught, you can punish them and even execute them if they refuse to recant, but don't listen to anonymous informants. This letter casts doubt on the notion that there was a state-sponsored push to root out Christianity in the first and second centuries that would have required a secret code. Roman officials still seemed confused about how to deal with what they viewed as a new superstition on the block, and Trajan himself says don't bother rooting them out and don't listen to anonymous tips. Add that to the fact that Roman law was woefully under-enforced. So we should question how effective or widespread any Roman persecution of Christians might have been in the early centuries. When we turn to the examples of the Licinia Amios and the Abercius epitaphs, I can't help but ask, how secret was this acronym, really? As far as we can tell, these were public inscriptions, probably set up in an open-air cemetery by relatively wealthy Roman family members of the deceased. So, if Roman persecutions before Decius were indeed widespread instead of local, you would think that these families would be taking a particularly expensive, unnecessary risk by hiring a local professional stoneworker to create and display the Ichthus cipher. I think a better explanation stems from Christian scribal culture. Christian scribes tended to abbreviate sacred names in their earliest manuscripts in a practice called nomina sacra. They shortened the word Theos to Theta Sigma, Jesus with Iota Sigma, Son with Upsilon Sigma. So, for example, here's a 3rd century manuscript preserving the first line of the Gospel of Matthew. And you can see abbreviations of Jesus, Christ, and Son right here, here, and here. Scribes did not write these abbreviations out of a sense of secrecy. Everybody knew what they meant but rather out of a sense of reverence for the words, and to visually highlight the most sacred words on the page. So, in the earliest centuries of Christianity, Christian scribes were already writing abbreviations of Jesus, Christ, Son, God, and Savior in their own books. And it's possible that Christians developed an acronym using the same letters that popped up again and again in their manuscripts as abbreviations. Three of the four most popular and earliest nomina sacra were Jesus, Christ, and God, which might have been enough to evoke the ichthus acronym among early Christians. This nomina sacra theory would suggest that literate scribes developed the ichthus acrostic first, and it eventually made its way into popular Christian practice. I think this better squares with at least some of our textual evidence. For example, one of the earliest textual attestations of Ichthus, if not the earliest example, appears as an acrostic in the Sibylline Oracles. These are a collection of prophecies and mystical utterances heavily redacted by Christian authors. So, appearing in a mystical text like the Sibylline Oracles suggests to me that at a very early date in Christian history, Ichthus was a form of mystical wordplay for literate Christian scholars. Scribes. Of course, this is only one of several theories. Some scholars have floated other theories, such as the idea that the fish symbol arose from the practice of baptism. Others say it was drawn from Greco-Roman zodiac imagery, with Pisces being a fish. But ultimately, the origins are obscure. 
Early Christian writers themselves don't even seem to know where it came from, or at least didn't care enough to write it down, and instead offered a bunch of different interpretations. But all of that to say we really cannot confidently assert that it emerged in response to Christian persecution. And stories about it functioning as a secret handshake seem to be modern pious legends, popularized in part by Hollywood. The 23 earliest and most relevant citations referencing the Jesus fish do not link it to persecution, only linking it to other Christian practices like baptism and the Eucharist. Yes, we can speculate it served a secret function, since people living in the Roman Empire liked inscribing unintelligible monograms on their buildings. But this is not enough evidence to build an entire persecution theory explaining the origins of the Jesus fish. For now, this theory must remain in the realm of speculation. Nevertheless, there's no doubt that the Jesus fish is one of the earliest Christian symbols and has lasted over the course of 2,000 years of Christian history. If you'd like to learn more about Christian origins, head on over to The Great Courses Plus. So one of my goals for 2021 is to cut back on social media and fill that time with more educational media that challenges me intellectually. The Great Courses Plus is a great resource for that, especially for those of you that are interested in religious studies. The Great Courses Plus is a subscription video learning service with lectures and courses taught by actual experts. They have courses on world religions like Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as thematic topics like the philosophy of religion. And of course, 11,000 other video lectures about anything you might be interested in, so science, math, history, literature, or even how to cook or play chess. A lot of you might be watching a video about the Jesus fish because you're interested in early Christianity, so I personally recommend Bart Ehrman's series, Lost Christianities. Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar at UNC and the best-selling author of a bunch of books on early Christianity. This lecture series digs into the diversity of early Christianity, the development of the New Testament canon, and the early Christian texts that did not make it into the Bible. The Great Courses Plus is offering Religion for Breakfast viewers a free trial, so just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash religionforbreakfast. Through your subscription, you gain access to their huge library of video lectures that you can stream from any device or even download and listen to, kind of like a podcast. Click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Thanks, everyone.